everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Deeper Into Him podcast. And today I am joined by Stefano Sifandos. Am I saying that correctly? There you are. <laughs> and he is a love and relationship coach and a masculine and feminine expert. And I really appreciate his work for being such like a real life applications of these dynamics and making it so relatable. And I can just see that so many people have been able to deepen their relating and, and live a life of conscious relating because of this man. So welcome, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. I'm so excited you're here. Um, do you want to just share briefly who you are and maybe right away, I'd love to hear a bit on what your own personal journey has been with the feminine. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think like most, um, for most men, uh, you know, my own personal journey with the feminine has been one that's been a little confusing. And when I look back at why, you know, I've, I mean, I've been studying archetypes and I've been studying rites of passage for quite some time. I've taken myself through many rites of passage. I've allowed myself to be taken through rites of passage as an adult. Unfortunately, I never had that experience as a young boy transitioning into manhood which is when boys need it the most. We need to almost be separated from the feminine, not because the feminine is bad, because we need to start developing our own whole sense of self. And the way we do that is through separation, through that nurturing, being with other men, being through very specific cultural and physiological rites of passage that take us into a transition point. And then we come back to the feminine, come back to our own sense of masculinity in a very different way. In the Western world, we don't have that. In modern modernity, we don't have access to that anymore. And so my relationship with the feminine has been quite distorted because for me and like most boys, most children growing up, not just boys, the, the, the parental dynamic is either separate. And so divorce rates, so we're talking about single parent households, or we're talking about most parental dynamics aren't healthy, not a healthy constitution. There are some, of course, that are, but most are not. And so if the parents are together, there's a separation there. There's, there's an internal separation. So for me, my father was absent a great deal. He was working a lot, but he was emotionally unavailable. And when he was home, he was often volatile and violent and abusive. And so there was an enmeshment and an entanglement that came through with myself and my mother, me being the eldest son as well. And so in psychological terms, an enmeshment or an entanglement is where the mother projects her unconscious, unmet emotional, psychological needs that she would normally get from her partner onto the child. And again, very clearly, it's unconscious. She's not purposely, um, it's, you know, I just did a video on this yesterday. It's, mm -hmm. it's called psychic incest or enmeshment or entanglement. And so that young boy being me, and this is not just me, but many, many young boys, particularly this mother-son um, dynamic, this unhealthy version of a mother-son dynamic, it becomes my responsibility to try and make sure mum's okay. So I'm looking up to mum thinking, I need mum to be okay. But that's a big, big burden and responsibility for a little boy or a child to have on his psyche. Mm -hmm. And so I can't meet that. And so what happens is I'll either get very frustrated or angry or infer that I'm not good enough. And then there's a projection that take place and there's this dance that takes place with the mum, mm -hmm. but also with the feminine that then is taken into adulthood yeah. that is distorted. And that can lead to infidelity, that can lead to disrespecting women, that can lead to internal anger and hating oneself, feeling isolated, not feeling good enough. So I felt the gamut of all of these growing up. Mm -hmm. And it's not blaming my mother and it's not blaming my father. It's not about blame. It's about understanding where we come from in order to heal those parts of us that need healing in order to feel whole. So we stop feeling so fractured and broken. And so my relationship to the feminine, it's been really not very healthy. In fact, it's been unhealthy because the relationship to my internal feminine wasn't there. It wasn't grounded. Yeah. It wasn't, I wasn't integrated in that space. Yeah. And there are a few reasons for that as I've outlined already. Yeah. Yeah. So for a lot of men that are probably listening to this and think, okay, so I have to connect to my internal feminine. Um, does that mean that I have to be just like a woman? No, no, definitely not. So and what's see, the masculine way of doing that? It's a great question. I love, I love how you've asked that as well. And so, so many people come to me, so I'll have men come to me and say, I need to be more feminine. Mm -hmm. And I look at them and I say, okay, why? I'll have women that come to me and say, I want my man to be more in his feminine. And I look at them and I'll say, why? And so, this is where I come to it from. This is what I 
have witnessed and what I've experienced in myself and in the thousands of people that I've worked with and what I believe to be true. So I believe that it's not so much that we're born with, but at a very early age, it may be it's part born with, it's part biology, part hormones, part gender, but it's also part culture, part exposure, part life mm-hmm. lessons, soul evolution, soul curriculum, whatever, right? We're born with a core energetic and our core energetic is either masculine or feminine. That doesn't mean that we don't carry any of the other um, energetic in us. Of course we do. It's, they reside within every human being. It's a contrast and balance of um, energy and it's how we express and it's how we learn in the world through contrast. But I believe we're born with this, this core, um, core energetic. Mm-hmm. Now, what I think happens is that we lose touch with that core energetic and we start layering masks mm-hmm. over ourselves and over our authentic expression because we're scared that if we're seen in a particular way, that will be shunted, that will be judged or ridiculed or humiliated or rejected or abandoned. And there's a tremendous fear that comes up. And so we hide ourselves. So what I say to men is don't try and be more, if you are in your core energetic as a, ma- as a man, as a masculine man, and your core energetic is masculine, be more of that in a healthy way. Mm. Don't go extreme because that's unhealthy and unsustainable. That's subjugation, that's control, that's judgment, that's oppression, that's violence in extreme forms, continuous to, for self-satisfaction or to hide from one's fears or to gain a sense of control in the world because one feels unsafe. But go into your healthy masculinity. Learn to be decisive. Learn to, these are just some characteristics, right? Learn to be clear in your expression. Learn to be postured. Learn to be in reverence of yourself and all other living beings. Mm. In your healthy masculinity. And when you do that by default, this feminine energy that you wish to cultivate, whatever, however you define that in terms of its characteristics, will naturally come because when you're in a healthy state, its complementary opposite will mm. attract and will mm. be present within you. That's, that's really my response to that. Oh, I love that. That's such a different perspective than what I've heard many times of instead of forcing a masculine man into his heart, just letting him find a healthy masculine and then the heart will naturally be okay. there. Yes, it will. Yeah. yeah. Cause you will realize the parts of our, us will realize what we actually need from within and from outside of us to yeah. feel whole. Yeah. Why do you think it's been so difficult for men to feel, to access their heart, to emote? Cause I know I have a lot of guys that like, I want to feel my wife wants me to feel, I don't feel much. I try. I don't see it. There's a few. Re- it's yeah. yeah it's a, another another really powerful, pertinent question. It's I think it's a combination of things. Um, I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's social norms and culture. I think it's more acceptable for men to see. Men are emotional. In fact, men are very, very much. In fact, some research says that men have a tendency to be more quote unquote emotional than women. Yeah. What happens is with men is it's not so much socially acceptable to be emotional in the sense of feeling fear or sadness or feeling jealousy as an example, or feeling um, pain or feeling grief, Mm. but we're conditioned to feel anger and aggression. It's natural for us or healthy for us. So we think to feel only anger and rage. And so, we often mask our primary emotions, what we want to be feeling, actually feel what the body wants to feel in that present moment with a secondary emotion of anger. And so anger becomes this, and anger is not just an emotion, but this state, anger then becomes this go-to state that mm. becomes the norm for us. That coupled with a narrative of men don't, can't feel or men aren't emotional, which is not true. We have a limbic system. Mm-hmm. We have a heart. We have neurons in the heart, in the brain. We have emotional processing faculties. We have capacity, but it's almost culturally indoctrinated out of us. It's it's, it's pushed out of us. And in saying that, when we look at biology, we look at evolutionary theory, or we look at evolutionary growth and how we've developed, men were also very much responsible for maintaining the safety of the tribe, Mm. largely. Mm-hmm. We're, we're bigger we're bigger beasts we're, mm-hmm. we're stronger physically stronger beasts. so we, we, were, we were tasked with hunting we were tasked with extending the perimeter we were tasked with keeping our environment safe in those moments of being more exposed to extreme danger 
our brains have developed in such, and our bodies and our nervous system has developed in such a way that feeling, and again, the limbic system is something that's developed after our, our primal brain or our, mm-hmm. our lizard brain called our reptilian brain, cerebellum, brainstem, etc. that feeling emotion can interfere with the amygdala and reactive functions. Yeah. And so that's still in us biologically. Now we live in a time because life has changed a lot in a, in a few million years from human or early humanoids to now we live in a time where we're not really in that much danger. Yeah. And so we have to consciously undo that. We have to consciously start seeing ourselves a little differently. And so we get to have that opportunity to do that. Yeah. That doesn't mean we have to sacrifice our quote unquote masculinity in order to feel we can still feel and still be in solid masculine presence. Yes. That's my take on that. Yeah. I love that idea of, of having that, that there's a go-to emotion, which I think for women might be sadness or for men might be anger. And yeah. it's often mask. It's just, it's the go-to. It's not necessarily what's underneath that. Yeah. Um, I think I'm then curious a bit about like what, what causes a man to shut down? Because this is part of the narrative that I find so disempowering that we speak about men like, oh, he just shuts down and he's just not there and he disconnects and he doesn't care. I don't believe that. So what, mm. what happens in a situation that a man shuts down? Mm. What's actually it, happening there? Yeah, there are many, there are many reasons. I'll actually take a, I'll, I'll take a human vantage point on this as opposed to just man and woman, but then mm. I'll, I'll get to, mm. I'll get to that as well. Yeah. yeah. I think we shut down for many reasons. I think primarily if we really strip it back, it's fear. Mm-hmm. And so we have fundamental human needs. We want to be seen. We want to be heard, accepted, understood, respected, uh, felt mm-hmm. in the world. We want to be seen. We really want to be seen, particularly for men. We really value being accepted and respected. It's yes. a big thing for us because so much of our self-worth is wrapped up in our utility, mm. in our ability to be valuable to others and mm. ourselves. Mm. And so if we feel or perceive that we are not being accepted and respected, that we're being judged, ridiculed, humiliated, rejected, we can shut down. We can shut down because we have unresolved, um, unchecked childhood wounding. We can shut down because we are in fear of being seen in a particular way. We are shut down because sometimes we think we're going to fail. We're shut down because we think we're going to be not taken for all that we are so we wear masks on on top of masks on top of Mm. masks on top of masks and we lose a sense of self we shut down because we can't emotionally self-regulate so it's easier to numb Mm. women will mostly do and again this is evolutionary Mm. stuff here women will shut down internally and almost space out and numb out men will leave the situation physically Yes. yes Yeah. And it's more of a yeah. male thing. Yeah. It is more of a male thing. Because again, in the wild, we've been conditioned fight, flight, freeze, but we've been more exposed to the wild in those early developmental years of humanoids. And we've boom, physically run. Females, when confronted with that social danger or social mm-hmm. issue, has shut down her internal faculties and gone numb within yeah. to numb any physical or emotional pain that comes towards her. Yeah, men do that as well, of course. But when we look at men and women a little differently, there seems to be more of a a, a dominance in that area for men and dominance in that area for women. So there's some of the reasons why we shut down. Yeah, yeah. So respecting the 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 masculine and and needing to be acknowledged and respected um, in a situation where she can't feel him. And maybe I'm getting at like the difference between inviting in the masculine and, and and complaining. But like, how do you invite him back into the presence back into the space in a way that honors that validation and that respect it's yeah. a beautiful question it's it, for me it's very simple and it's been my experience as well you know I've, I've i've never shifted more in my life oh what well, tell a lie sorry <laughs> two reasons two two big things that have helped me shift in my life my own self-reliance and going inward Mm -hmm. and really being in that space of I can do this and then the the various processes, the solitude practices, the stillness, the silence, everything that Mm -hmm. comes with that. And the outside of myself is the compassion and the non-judgment and the gentleness of a a woman. 
mm. and of the feminine, of that feminine energetic mm. of compassion, non-judgment and touch. Mm. So if your man is shutting down and you're not always going to, and again, you have to, you can't, um, you can't be attached to the outcome because if you're attached to the outcome, it will influence how you behave because then you're in that masculine energetic of goal yeah. orientation. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's got to be, if, if you're a woman and, you're, and, you're, and your man is breaking down or he's numb or he's distancing himself physically or emotionally, yeah. you can only do what you can do, but you can't heal him or heal for him. He can only heal himself. Yeah. But what you can do is create that safe, nurturing, loving space. And for me, mm -hmm. my personal experience and what I've seen in so many others is when that woman comes with that genuine intention and holds that man's hand and looks at him and says, I see all of you, all of you is welcome. There is no shame here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I meet all of you with that compassion, non-judgment. The chances are that it will help break down those barriers and the armor that he puts around his heart. Is it always going to work? No. And that's not because you're not doing it right or you're doing it wrong or you're not doing it enough or you're not sincere enough. Not at all. Because when I've felt shame, yeah. nothing breaks that shame. You know, I, I expressed this, yes, a couple of days ago in, in, a, in a conversation. Whenever I feel shame, two things are happening for me. I feel like I'm literally spiraling down a drain, a sewage drain that's infinite. It's never ending. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I feel like these invisible walls are growing past my body in every direction and just pushing out and they're impenetrable. Yeah. And yeah. that's how paralyzing shame is. And for men, it's so embarrassing, so shameful, so painful, so much fear that they're literally like stunned fish out of water. Yeah. And, and there's sometimes nothing that you can do. However, there, it, it can penetrate that armor. It really can, yeah. but it can't guarantee it, but it's not about that because there's growth obviously for the, for the woman that is holding that space and being in that, in that posturing as well for the man and for herself. Yeah. I love what you're talking about now because it's, it's been something I've been exploring for myself. Like the feminine energy is very much the receiving energy, but the feminine energy is also one of giving love. Mm. And so how is that different from the masculine giving love? And then I think a lot of women are conditioned to think that the feminine giving of love is a mother like energy. So they relate baby to their partners and like, let me mother you while you go through your pain. And what you're describing now is not necessarily a mothering, but it is a holding his hand or just actually the love of like, whatever you show me, it's okay. Yeah. You know, I still, I feel love for acceptance. you. Yeah. It's an acceptance. Yeah. So it's a whole acceptance. You know, yeah. you're right. We get confused. We do get, yes, the fe feminine energetic is receiving a masculine energetic is giving, but the feminine and masculine energetic reside within all of us, all genders mm -hmm. all things. And so if a woman is giving, she's maybe in a, in a, in a streamline or a slipstream of the masculine energetic giving, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but she'll give through her own cultural lens. She'll give mm -hmm. through her own, biological or gender-based lens she'll give through her own value-based lens she'll give through the the era that she lives in mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that masculine is only um sorry that giving is only a, a male energy mm. it's a masculine energetic that it's just the way we used to describe it but women yin and yin. Yang. yeah yeah it's exactly right yeah so i want to maybe pick your brain a bit on the wounding that we see in women or the wounded feminine of, I think a lot of women are very stuck in their masculine. Mm. Right. And, and they're so occupied with just showing the world that you can do it alone mm. and that you don't need anybody and that you're not needy and that you're not crazy and you're not high maintenance and you're chill and whatnot. Um, my work is a lot in helping women receive again. And that is so terrifying that is so terrifying. What's your view a bit on, on what's happening with women on this like over-reliance on self? Mm. Yeah. Well, part of the wounded masculine wants to take control of everything and part of the wounded feminine wants to um, be saved mm. Mm. and victimize herself. And this exists within men and women. And what's happening specifically to what you're mm. talking about around mm. women that are in this massively extreme masculine energetic are struggling to receive uh, 
again, all about completion energy, goal orientation. It's a product of our society. Our society, when I say our society, I'm talking about our socioeconomic society of capitalism. I want to just say, okay, let's put a caveat on this. It's not about capitalism being bad. Mm -hmm. It's not about our socioeconomic model being bad. It's about Mm -hmm. it being, having morphed into an extreme version of itself. Yeah. which prioritizes and values largely the masculine energetic of yeah. goal accomplishment, creation, yeah. status yeah. orientation, wealth accumulation, yeah. um, object, objectification, action orientation. And so if you want to survive in a world that values that, because remember, let's go back to what I said a moment ago, we all want to be seen. We mm-hmm. all want to be heard, understood, respected, appreciated, mm-hmm. revered, loved. If we want that and we live in a world that values these character, these expressions, then we're going to fall into that. And so women, in order to be seen and heard and valued in our society, largely in a Western democratic, socioeconomic, capitalistic society, are now moving towards these energetics. And for many women, not all, but for many women, it doesn't feel completely natural. It's extreme to be in that energetic too long because it's not a core energetic for them. And so we're finding people that are feeling very displaced in themselves. Yeah. And we, we look at the feminist movement and the waves of feminist movement and the way that we've ostracized masculinity and being a man. Mm-hmm. I have women come to me all the time. I want a man. Yeah. Yet society ostracizes masculinity and it yeah. vilifies it. And what we need to be vilifying is extreme versions of both masculinity and femininity or extreme versions of expression, not masculinity yeah. itself because femininity wouldn't exist without masculinity and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming, men come to me that are very passive, hyper passive, yeah. very meek and weak and withdrawn yeah. and not knowing who they are and not stepping into their power. We, again, we have that association. Power is bad. No, power is not bad. Subjugation is not healthy. Mm-hmm. Control and autocracy is not healthy. Mm-hmm version of masculinity that's not masculinity in its healthy form that's not healthy leadership that's not that's not connected leadership yeah and so there's there's a combination of things happening that are really affecting how we see ourselves and how we're dealing with others yeah yeah um i saw you read a post uh, about the peter pan syndrome Mm. and i'd love to to just hear your view on that. Cause I think, especially if you learn about polarity and you learn it from David data and mm. you get this whole sense that men want freedom, right? The masculine wants freedom. And then how does freedom for a healthy masculine, how does that combine with commitment? How does that come together? So for me, I found that this is very interesting. It's a paradox, right? I found yeah. great freedom in my relationship but only after i had done a lot of deep work on myself and had healed those past aspects of me the pain that i had experienced for me that peter pan syndrome it comes from a number of different places and depends on individual circumstances but essentially if as a as a boy as a young boy you were restricted in your expression or you witnessed your father behave in a particular way, such as come and go as he pleases, be a womanizer, not respect your mother. Um, If you saw your mother really hurt and feel restricted in her expression or your father, Mm. you can tend to carry that ideology of, I never want to be trapped. trapped. I never want to be restricted. And so you become indecisive, you become Mm non-committal, you become unsafe because you're not able to be really clear on who you are. You're Mm -hmm. always chasing the sun. You're looking for something better. It's a grass is greener mentality. Yeah. You can never say, you can never remain stable because you, you just, you never were allowed to explore yourself. And so as an adult, all you want to do is explore yourself. Maybe you'll criticize a great deal. Yeah. Maybe your own freedoms were taken away from you because you grew up in a war-torn country or because, again, people can go another way, but these are yeah. some of the reasons for yeah. all that Peter Pan syndrome. Yeah. Um, you know, you weren't play, you didn't play, you weren't valued as a child. You weren't seen for who you really were. Um, and, and, and you fear commitment because maybe you, you witnessed your, 
your father make commitments in business and lost all of his business. And the way that he dealt with that in the family dynamic was very oppressive and fear-based. So you develop that. So you don't want to make any commitments, not to a, a relationship, not to a business, not to a career, not to where you live. Um, you know, and that, that, that immature emotional development or lack of development mm. is not carried over into adulthood. And so where that Peter Pan is erratic, is unreliable, is inconsistent, is unavailable, yeah. fears yeah. change. Um, but the thing is, this is really, is, you know, it fears change yet thrives in change. And so they're, yeah. they're very selfish, yeah. struggle to express, express truthfully, um, can't deal with challenge because challenge is a threat to his way of living and being would disappear when the, when it gets difficult, I just can't be with a challenge. Um, yeah. lives in, in fantasy a great deal, a great deal lives in fantasy. Um, can't really hold emotional space for others. Yeah. Doesn't have that capacity and essentially just carries a great deal of unresolved, um, unresolved wounding. Yeah. It's a very powerful force, I think, for myself and a lot of the stories I hear from women. This is really how they, the men that they've had in front of them a lot. And so that translates into the feminine of like, I need to make sure I'm not needy. I need to make sure I'm cool. I'm not high maintenance. I'm not this. I'm not that. Yeah, this is interesting, right? And so many men, not all, but many men that have this Peter Pan syndrome, mm -hmm. they either hate their father. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, largely they dislike or disregard or hate their father. Mm -hmm. And because they dislike him, there's parts of them that want to be like him. Right. And in order to be like him, they have to be familiar, they have to engage in familiar behavior to seek his approval. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, because they dislike their father and how much pain their father's inflicted on them emotionally or physically or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. or absence, whatever that may be, they not only shun their father, but they shun the masculine. Yes. And they shun the masculine within themselves. And they move towards the feminine because more often than not, there's an enmeshment and an entanglement with the mother, which is the association of the feminine as well in our, during mm -hmm. our early years, which we take these ideals into our adult lives. And so we gravitate towards the feminine, but we also gravitate towards extreme expressions of feminine within ourselves, such as being hyper passive, being uh, non-committal. That's not what the feminine is. The feminine is discerning. The feminine is fucking fierce and powerful yeah. in a healthy expression. Yeah. Like the masculine is powerful and sturdy and reliable in his healthy expression. In his unhealthy expression, he's controlling, he's oppressive. Rigid. Yeah. Uh, rigid. Yeah. And so that, Peter Pan boy is caught between pushing away the father, but throwing out the baby with the bathwater because as he's pushed away his father, he's pushed away masculine energy. And so he's become effeminate himself. Oh, so interesting. In an extreme way. And that's part of the Peter Pan syndrome too. That's so interesting. So remind me again, like how you as in a masculine energy when mm. You, you must also have this urge for freedom, for, for oh. peacefulness, for quietness, maybe for just, you know, stillness. Yeah. So how, how do does, I find that in relationship? Yeah. How does that, how does that come together? Yeah. Well, well, firstly, I, I bring in, I attract, well, firstly, I, I create a, a healthy, healthier sense of self and I'm constantly right. working on that. I'm open to that. Mm -hmm. And therefore that attracts healthy people in my life. And so, my wife understands that. She knows that. She's not insecure in her being where she needs to constrict me. Mm. Um, so I don't feel constricted in the relationship. Mm. I know that I can talk to my wife about anything, mm. anything and vice versa. Mm. And so if something comes up where I say, look, I'm feeling restricted. I feel I need to have this experience. Let's talk about it. I know it may go against your values. In fact, it pushes against mine. Whether, you know, whether it's say, something sexual or, Hey, I need to go to Antarctica by myself for six months or what you know, whatever. Like I'm, I'm very adventurous. So I, <laughs> I do shit like this um, in terms of like, <laughs> wanting to explore the world, but also I don't feel restricted in our relationship. Right. And I'll create the space. I'll get up early if I want to, I'll mm. sit in silence and stillness. I'll tell my beloved, I'll say, darling, I need a few days on my own. I want to just go out camping or I want to mm. just go somewhere by myself for a couple of days and, 
everything's fine. I just, she just knows that. We, we, yeah. we, if she needs something, I'd give that to her. And so yeah. we have those conversations. So I don't feel we should because this is the first relationship that I have been in where it's really been deeply, deeply honest. Mm. there's just there's not a fear of sure sometimes there may be apprehension about speaking about something difficult i'm human she's human Mm -hmm. but there's not that fundamental fear because we're committed to each other i can't fathom my life without her in it yeah and that's not because i'm unhealthily attached to her i don't feel i am i just i feel that we're really willing to grow together Mm. and that 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 makes a big difference Mm. what's uh, in your opinion then the difference maybe between neediness and having needs? Well, the neediness comes from a place of fear, comes from yes. unresolved childhood wounding, comes mm-hmm. from a sense of I, I'm not enough, mm-hmm. comes from codependence. Mm-hmm. And so codependence in ve- is vested in, I can't be happy unless you are, so I'm going to do everything I need to do or I'm going to latch onto you energetically, emotionally, physically, psychically yeah. to ensure that I can get what I need. Enmeshment, yeah. Enmeshment, yeah. yeah. Needs are essentially a healthy understanding of your values and what's important to you and then an ability to healthily express them in a non-confrontational way with confidence and without demand. And just right. confidence in self, meaning, hey, these are my needs. Are you in alignment? If not, that's okay, but let's talk about what that looks like. Right, right. That's super beautiful. You speak a lot about conscious relationships, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> What's like one thing that people can practice to, to, to start addressing in their relationship? I think this notion of one plus one equals three. And what I mean by that is that you don't come to the relationship half-hearted or a fragment or um, or a fragment of a person. You know, it's not my half and your half makes a whole and we complete each other. It's two whole beings coming together to create a third entity being the relationship itself and then asking the question of how does our relationship how does our coming together not only impact our lives positively and healthily Mm. but how does it impact those around us our friends our family our communities our culture the earth beautiful that's an important part of a conscious relationship Mm, i love that i think that's so gorgeous I'm just reminded on something I wanted to ask you also, I think related to that is when we do show, like when we go into relationship, our old stuff will come up, our wounding will come up, right? And we talked about the difference between enmeshment and healthy attachment. So what if you're having a discussion with your partner and you notice their little boy or girl is coming onto the service? Because I'll tell you personally, it makes me very angry. Mm. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. So my question is very much like, what, what if you see that happen in your partner? What, what's the, what's the best way to, the best way to respond to that? For me, one of the most effective ways to respond to that level of tension that's being yeah. triggered and being, it's being pushed against the edges are coming together yeah. of each other is, is to exactly do that is to see that little boy or girl. So for example, say you and I are friends, we're friends and we're having a conversation We've been long-time friends. Whether you're in a romantic partnership or not, it's mm-hmm. not either relevant. It's just we have an intimate uh, platonic relationship and I see you getting really angry and really agitated and frustrated and disorientated. And now, I can do a couple of things. I can go into my defensiveness or hyper-masculinity and say, oh, what have I done wrong? How can I fix this? Or I can get angry at you back and don't mm-hmm. you talk like this in front of me or whatever. Or... I can see it for what it is and see that. And then we're making an assumption here that I haven't done anything directly to offend you or upset you. Right? Um, that, that's a clear assumption. And even, even if I have, let's say you're, you know, quote unquote, really going for it, or really reacting hard. I can sit in that, still set healthy boundaries about how I want to be treated. But if I see that little seven-year-old girl in you and I see that you're really being triggered and you're just feeling really unsafe, right? Mm. And I, and I see you and I don't judge your expression. And I say to you, I see you. Like I literally say those words. I see that seven year old girl. in you. Mm. 
Mm. I see that you're hurting. I see that you're feeling unsafe right now. And I'm sorry that you're feeling that way. And someone may say, why are you sorry? You haven't done anything. Don't be responsible for it. It's fucking not about that. It's not about that. It's about how can we bond as human beings? I'm not taking responsibility for your pain. I'm empathizing with you. Mm. And I see that little girl and I see that little girl that's in turmoil. What if I just remain stable and predictable? What if I don't remain erratic? What if I start breathing a little deeper, Mm. start softening my posture, letting you know that I'm there for you, letting you know that if there's something that you need, I'm willing to explore what that looks like and how I can help you. Letting you know that I'm not going anywhere. Letting you know that I'm here for you if you need something. Letting you know that I'm not going to get angry at you, that I accept all of you and all of you is welcome. What are the chances of your expression moving from a fear-based panic state into a karma state? What are the chances of that? I'd say pretty high. Yeah. And that's how we heal past wounds. That's how we start changing the present and we stop being, where we cease to be run by our old patterns and old biology and old neuronal frameworks. That's how we help each other heal. I can't heal you. Anyone that claims to heal you is full of shit. They can't. However, we can provide a safe space for each other to produce a healing effect where you can heal yourself. Yeah. And we get to do that together. And that's what relational beings are about. Yeah. That's what being in relationships are about. Yeah. I love that you're speaking about this because I, I notice, especially a bit in the conscious community, there's kind of this, this valuation of hyper independence in relating yeah. like your traumas are yours. You need to deal with your triggers. You need to hold your own inner child. I'm, it's not my problem. You're just in a trigger. And that feels so empty because why are we then in a relating? And I love what you're talking about here because it's not about fixing the other in their trigger. It's not about being the reason that they don't have a trigger anymore. It's about bringing compassion. And that's such a different kind of interaction. It's still not a fixing thing. It's just, Mm -hmm. hey, I see you and I I feel compassion for you. Yeah. And that softens it, right? That makes... I believe so. I mean, I don't want to say nine times out of 10, but I'd say in the vast majority of times. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a little more effort, you know, and that requires more patience and that requires the individual that's holding that space to have done deeper work on themselves, to know themselves, trust themselves and know that Mm -hmm. their little child doesn't have to be triggered. So they can talk to their little boy or girl and say, Hey, it's okay. This isn't about you. This is about them. Why don't we serve them in this way? And Hey, this is not fucking easy. No. This is tough. I struggle with this, I, uh, but it's a learning, right? But the more awareness we bring to it, the more front of mind it is, the more likely we are to actually go there, you know? Yeah. So what about in yourself? Like you're in relating and, and maybe you're more on the anxious or the avoidance side. And, and for instance, let's say you're more on the avoidance side and you want to kind of take your distance from a person and that might come out of a trigger or it might just be that you're genuinely not that into them. How do we feel the difference of what is our genuine feelings towards that person and what's coming from a pain place or maybe from a wounded place? Do you understand my question? I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> I think um, we look at patterns and we look at right. history. So if something's repetitive, mm. chances are it's an unconscious pattern that's being run. So if you're consistently, you know, running away when it gets difficult, chances are you're the common denominator. It's not necessarily their quote unquote fault. So I think that's a good starting point. If you look at patterns, because again, our brains are pattern recognizing machines with internally and externally with our environment. I think we get the opportunity to do that um, in our relationships. So say, oh, this is a pattern. I did this in the last relationship and in the relationship before that and in the relationship before that. And they're all different, but I'm the same. Well, I'm, a, I'm me. It's me. So I've got to look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's a really good one. Hey, right, my final question. Um, mm. Yeah, it's going very fast. What, yes, what do you love about the feminine? What Oof. do you love about the feminine in the world and yourself? What do you love about the feminine? You know, you touched on something really interesting earlier around, around nurturing. Mm. Um, you know, around, around giving and, should I say around giving and receiving? Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that, that women give or the feminine gives as well. Absolutely. 
what I love most about the feminine is her ability to nurture at such depth. And it inspires me so much that the, the females and the feminine in my life has been able to be so non-judgmental, mm. non-critical mm. with me, no matter what I've done. And that just has astonished me and inspired me so much. It's inspired me to be a better human being. Mm. That just that level of compassion and non-judgment. And just, I ask myself, I don't believe it sometimes. I really don't. I just think oh, you're full of shit. You're lying. You're not being truthful because it's so real. It's so fucking real that it hurts mm. because most men have never been able to see themselves the way that, the feminine outside of themselves witnesses them. Yes. And it's very overwhelming because we get to see how beautiful and how fucking amazing we actually are. And that's very confronting when for most of your life, you've been told that you're nothing, that you're yeah. worthless. Yeah. Cause that's all you've known. And, and that, that has been a big journey for me and really a big part of that. Yeah. I've definitely been responsible. I've taken the action. I've made the choices, but, without that reflection from the feminine outside of me, I wonder where I would be today. I love that because I ask every, every man that I interview for this podcast that question, and often this is the answer, just this non-judgmental love. And it just strikes me how many women, I think, try to criticize their man into being something better oh man, like you need to work out more. You need to meditate. You need to do this. I know you can do better. I know you're a great guy somewhere. And there's all this critique in there when actually when you ask a man this question, it's actually that non-judgmental love is what inspired me yeah. to be the best version of myself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stefanos. Thank if you. If people want to hear more about you, want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Grow with Steph dot com probably stuff.com and i highly recommend checking out his social media because his posts are absolutely incredible like i don't know many people that can pack that much wisdom in the <laughs> in instagram post so highly highly recommend thank you so much for your time thank you